So here we are in New Cross and uh, just met Mark Winter. Now Mark's the brother of Dirty Den, who we've also interviewed. Um, so Mark, um, it's great to meet you tonight. Thank and you. Um, I've talked to your brother and it sounds like you're the, the older ones. Yeah, yeah. We, we, I'm the oldest one and we're from a musical family, yeah? Um, well, we started playing music from when we was about the age of 14 and we were still at school and you know we were going to the blues dances and we was playing notably the sound at the time in east london was a sound called chicken and we were playing doing their warm-up session and there was nobody there but we had to do it and get up and go to school so from there on we um formed a sound system um and that's myself my brother dirty den Harold Morris, there was Errol Douglas, Roger Moore, and my younger brother, Gary Winter. And um, that was the early days of Lovers Rock. So we, we were amongst one of the first, particularly in East London Hackney, to be playing Lovers Rock on, on, on a scale, you know, um, seven days a week sometimes twice on the day so we were doing all the local with with the lovers rock and that that era started late 1978 um you know the beginning of 1979 and during that time we'd always play soul music as well because soul music always complemented the, the lovers rock and the revival which we were playing and uh, you know as a lot of our early soul influences came from the likes of um, Roxy Soul Sam which at the time most of the members were living on our road so we was able to pick that up pick that up and play the soul music in our dances um, and that, that with the lovers rock and that took us on to about 1985, 1986. This is after the sound had a good run of about seven years. And it slowly disbanded. And my brother Dennis and Harold formed Company Soul Sound. Company Soul Sound um, has its roots in one of the early instigators or inventors of rear groove and that's where Dennis start to um, show his deep knowledge in, in music which he'd done extensive traveling collecting music and giving it to people and, and, and teaching people about um, early rear groove music and that's really where it started so um, we're talking, I mean, what, what date would you say that that characteristic two-step sound that later became known as two-step, when would you say that was starting to be played as a, a major characteristic of the night and a major feature of the night? Well, for, throughout the Lovers Rock era, we always played two-step, um, you know, the Marvis Staples, um, the Betty, the, the Betty Swans. Um, we were always playing that, and it transitioned into the rear groove. Um, but you know, it was something that we'd always played, and uh, and this was actually given to us by our our pals Roxy Salsa, who we learned a lot from. So, because I'm trying to get the timeline. Uh, I think the term rare groove, you know, came a little bit later. When was the first time you actually heard the phrase two-step? Because obviously it was just, it was reggae and what I would refer to at the time as soft soul, but that's later become known as the two-step. And I'm guessing that, because again, you're the expert here, I'm guessing that that soft soul um, became the two-step. 
No, I actually think it was the other way around because two-step for us has always been two-step because it's, you know, it, it came with a particular dance. And um, so it enabled you to, you know, shuffle around with the woman and that was the highlight of the dance. Um, playing those two-step music, you know, um, as I said, you know, Betty Swan was always my favorite one. And, and we, we were playing that from day one. And that was, as I said, 1978. And a lot of the early two steps, I mean, a lot of them were back from the 60s. Yeah. 1965, 68. And we were playing, it, particularly in the early hours of the morning. Because I'm, I'm particularly interested, obviously your heritage goes back all that way. Mm. I'm particularly interested in that transition point where people actually gave it this tag it's rare groove mm. um, and you know I'm, I'm very interested in pinpointing that moment where the two-step became known as rare groove on your on your scene uh, I think it was the transition uh, particularly um, with ourselves from our sound system Sabrina and um, that was predominantly reggae and it was around 1980s 586 around that sort of thing that um, Dennis and Harold formed company Soul Sam and that was as as the name suggests was predominantly a soul so that's where the transition came in from they were playing the two-step and and the soul music in the dance but toasting over them like like in, a, in how we used to do on the reggae dance um, and, and as I said, that happened around 1985, 1986, around that sort of area. Yeah, which exactly corresponds with the rare groove scene, the funkier side mm. that was happening mm. you know, in the West End that was based more around the JBs. And this is the, this is the moment mm. that I find fascinating because, mm. uh, you know, as, as I've discussed with other people, um, the two scenes started to influence each exactly. other yes. um, you know the stuff we were playing in the wag club africa center we were starting to learn about the leroy hudson's we were starting mm -hmm. to learn about you know the 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 connoisseur side the royers side um, which we hadn't been exposed to in the very early days of the wag club we you know we'd hear all the jb stuff but it wasn't until for me I think um, 80, 86, 87, that I started actually hearing, you know, this this beautiful music, um, you know, the slower tempo stuff that you guys had been playing for quite a long time. Mm. So I'm, I'm always fascinated to hear, you know, where these two scenes started to influence each other. Mm. I mean, in your two-step scene, were you were you playing the JBs? Were you playing the the funkier side, or were you just sticking, you know, mainly to the the slow soul to fit it, in? It was mainly the soul, slow soul. Um, you get the likes of the Teddy Pentagraph, the Jones Girls, the Emotions. You know that that type of soul, more more um, two steppy, and. At that time, to, 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 just before Lover's Rock sort of finished its peak, um, people started toasting over, you know, they were doing it before, but in our particular blues dances, they started toasting over the, 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 the music, um, which brought another element. And as I said, you know, when the... The, the sound change into a rare groove, that toasting element continued with it, but on soul music, which was a new thing and people found it fascinating. And, you know, they were in the blues dances and that was the start of your all night dances till, you know, seven, eight o'clock or later in the morning. And I, I, I definitely say around 85, that was the birth of, of, of so the explosion of rare groove. So what we'd love to do, um, you know, to document it is to give props to, you know, the unsung heroes. Mm. And um, I'd love you to talk about, you know, some of the people that you've already mentioned and maybe mm. if you want to bring in some other names. Mm. Um, and again, bring these people to, uh, you know, 
bring these people alive mm. uh, through the oral history mm. so that the new generation can learn about the characters and mm. some of the things that went went on in the scene. Mm. So, yeah, I'd love you to just, you know, transport yourself back mm. there. What, um, what happened at that time, I sort of withdrew out of the business and but at the same time, we had sounds like Sir George, and then later on we had um, GQ, um, Manhattan Sounds, and um, Mystery, and we we uh, Sir George was made their name from playing at a club called Oasis, and. That was in the time of the Lovers Rock. And when that came off, then you had Mystery, which was one of the early inventors of rear groove, um, took up residency in the spot. And he made a big, absolutely big, massive impact into the whole scene. Um, and then you had, um, is it Slim Tip, Touch of Class? Um, it's just a whole load of names which has just gone out of my head. Um, oh, we'll, we'll come back to that in a minute. So, you know, I've, I've talked to your brother and your brother was out in the States, yes. you know, digging in dusty warehouses. <laughs> and I love those stories. <laughs> um, and was he keeping the music under wraps at first when he came back or was he distributing it straight to the music lovers? Dennis was distributing it straight to the music lovers. I mean... Part and parcel he went out there was to to discover new music and bring it back because most of the music which um, we enjoy now they were just sitting in warehouses and probably at the time you know at the time of their release didn't actually do much that's why there were bundles of them in a warehouse so Dennis was on the mission he knew the type of sound that he wanted and um, he and uh, I think it was a guy named Colin Henry. Um, scoured um, various states in America and I met a lot of English people doing the same thing at the same time um, like um, my friend Malcolm from Soul, Soul Brothers Records and that's where we all became friends I didn't actually go with him but I got the tail in I've come back Mark Mark I've got this big batch of records we need to we, we need to get rid of them we need to to, to to let people know about this and once you let people know about it they just disappeared and it was just a, a, a trip after trip he, he got a batch sold them got money went back etc etc so as his brother you must have been i mean it's exciting just hearing this story but as his brother did you get like first dibs on the uh, the records that came back did you oh, go oh my god that one i'm keeping for myself i'm gonna play that out <laughs> definitely 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 on on one occasion i mean uh, we were there on a family holiday we were in uh, los angeles yeah at compton we were actually in compton part of hollywood and we were with the whole family and dennis just said to me i was going to look for some records and mind you it was a freezing cold day and we didn't see Dennis until the next day. And he had the car and everything. And he came back with a car load of records and just a smile on his face. And the whole family were absolutely upset with Dennis because we were freezing and we wanted to see the sights, etc., etc. But there was Dennis with a whole load of the latest records, which nobody had ever heard of. So uh, name a couple of tunes that like, as soon as they hit the deck when you were playing through these this pile of tunes like you were oh my god this i, I can't wait to play this as an exclusive because no one else has played it before casanova. i remember there was coffee casanova um you can't come here no more I'm trying to remember. I, I could see this 12 inch in my head and I just can't name it. Um, and, and one of them were the Valentine's Brothers. Um, their album, 
and I remember when Dennis brought that back and I said I've got to have that and it went on to you know absolutely explode and I was fortunate enough to be able to bring them over in a concert in the O2 um, along with Rolanda Gittins and Michael Fontaine and um, it was an honour to, to actually meet them. Yeah of course Michael does legends of uh, Rare Groove legends. Yeah. So um, yeah, I'd I'd love to get round to interviewing Michael at some mm -hmm. point because he's been instrumental. You know, instrumental in bringing the artists over and mm -hmm. and giving these guys you know almost a second career. Mm -hmm. So again, returning to your your brother and your sound system, um, this is called the Untold Story of Rare Groove, and. Everyone I interview, I, w I want to try and get a nugget out of them, something that's never been told before, something that uh, can now be told, or, or maybe a personal story, which you would like to obviously just put down, put down as part of the document and the untold story. Well, you know, they say that everything happens for a reason. Um, as I said before, we had a sound called Sabrina sound, and that was predominantly reggae. And Dennis was part of it, like myself. But the problem we had as two brothers, we just couldn't see eye to eye. You know, Dennis was a person and he's still like that now. If you tell him 10 o'clock, he's gonna come at two o'clock and he's gonna have a big smile on his face, like there's nothing wrong. And you know, that went on, but it frustrated me so much that we ended up at loggerheads, almost fighting. And, and that was one of the main transitions from Sabrina to what is now Company Soul Sound and um, well I think it was a blessing from God because it, 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 it put him out on a different platform under in a different genre and he actually made his name and he profited large from it. Well it sounds like you know you, you've had some amazing experiences and again for the people that weren't there um, Another thing I ask everyone to do is, is just imagine one event, something that's really special to you. You were obviously behind the decks most of the time, but um, tell us a story where you were actually, you know, out there going to an event and a very special event that meant a lot to you and influenced you. And tell us it from, you know, the beginning of the evening, how you heard about it to arriving at the event and just talk us through the whole event to again for people who weren't there as part of the scene just give them a you know a good feeling about how it went down in those days now, uh, now that that has got me I think one of my earliest re recollections of that actually gave me the, the want or the need to, 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 to pursue a career and a, a, a glorified hobby in music is the very first time we played at a party. I remember we we're all getting ready and we were about 14 at the time. And we, as I said, we had a sound system, which meant that we had, um, you know, we had to have our own equipment, speakers, etc., etc. And it was somebody's birthday party. I think it may have been a 16th birthday party. And at that time, we didn't have any vans to take our equipment around we were still young so we we had no alternative but to carry the stuff and it was about a mile's journey so you can imagine with the speaker box and those days we the vinyl we had a record box which was like a coffin and we had to walk about a mile to this party um you know there's probably 15 of us you know, by the time we wrote to our friends and we played, we, we got there, we strung up and we played in it and it was such a brilliant party. And 
People didn't want to go home. They enjoyed themselves so much. And we decided we've got to do something to stop this party. So I remember at the time we played, uh, I said, you know what, I've got this record in my record box. It's madness. It's a record by madness. And I says, I know black people, they're going to like boo you and, 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 and just leave the party. And when I played the record, it was like, whoo, it turned the party right round on its head. And the people, I think it played for about half an hour straight and the party continued. And I think it was at that point I said, you know what? We can make a really good living out of this. And this was 45 years ago. It wasn't one step by, uh, beyond. It was one step beyond. How did I know that? Because that, was, for me, I remember going to a party, but, was it around 1980, that came on at a student mm. party and the place went wild. It, but we played it, you know, it's not a normal record that we would play. We played it to get rid of everyone in the party and it had the opposite effect. And just to confirm, I've never met you before and we hadn't talked about this, had we? <laughs> this no. isn't, yeah. No, that, that, well, that's a, that's a fantastic story. Uh, just something you touched upon, because I'm really interested again. You know, what made the, um, you know, the soul sound so amazing? Obviously, as you've mentioned, it was playing it on a reggae sound system. Just on a technical side, because obviously you, you were building sound systems. Can you tell me, uh, you know, what, what, what setup you had to get that huge, big bass end that, was, uh, that made the music sound so fantastic? Well, we used to make our own boxes and we had um, double, mo double boxes, you know, I think it was a bit in those days, double boxes. And they were made out of formica and padded with foam. So we would put two 12 inches and my uncle was a carpenter and he used to reinforce it. Um, we had, um, I forgot the name of the amps, but around the time when we started, it was the first time we were introducing twin turntables um, because prior to the party, we were playing on a single deck. I actually had a garage deck and uh, we went to a place and we saw Sir George Sound System playing with these these decks and they were all lighting up twin decks and they were citronic decks so I says I've got to get myself one so we went to my dad and my dad says okay he will sponsor us and um, we got a citronic deck and I cannot remember the name of the amps um, and, and the graphics to go with it um, but that was sort of like I think it was a break from your traditional sound system setup where we used twin turntables. Yeah, because you know, when you, even when you see someone like Abishanti playing at the carnival, mm -hmm. he has the deck up really high, one deck mm -hmm. puts mm -hmm. on the plastic mm -hmm. and uh, takes it off the same turntable and, and puts, puts on the next up. one. So that, yeah, I can see that's like a reggae tradition. Yeah. And it is interesting that. Um, yeah, you're saying that the, when the twin turntables came along, yeah. it did change slightly the characteristic of how people actually played the music. It did, and, and it was actually fascinating just to look because people were just introduced to all the LED lights, which was fascinating. And we used to play uh, um, what they're called dub plates and we had a tape machine. So sometimes we'd go to the studio and we would get the, um, the dubs on the tape. And at that time, you could rewind a cassette tape, you know, in a bit way, you know, when the record spins back now on these. So we used to do that with um, the cassette tapes. So was that where the rewind came from, the classic rewind? It could possibly, it could possibly, but it, we'd done a lot of that um, during those early days. Because we would have a stack, so we'd have the tape deck, the equaliser, the amps, and everything in the stack. And then on top of that, you would have your Citronic turntable. So, absolutely get this, that uh, having a carpenter in the family was yes. an essential, essential part of the crew. Yeah. And it just so happened that we lived opposite a woodyard, so we were getting all our wood absolutely free. 
and we was able to make it in the middle of the road. So getting it free, are we, is this part of the untold story? It is, it is, it is, it is. Would you like to elaborate on that or is that enough? Well, that, that, that's enough because, you know, I mean, that w my dad was friends with the person that owned the woodyard, so they would always give it to us because on that, uh, in those early stages, we were able on the street to make the boxes. Yeah and have street parties at the same time. Yeah. Um, so whereabouts in London was this? And this was in Hackney, Clapton. Yeah. So your, your parties must have been notorious. Notorious, seven days a week. Well, again, I, I'd like this to be your platform as well, because um, for you to say anything that you want, um, to again, give props, to tell us where you're playing now, or well, links, links that um, you might you know, get the younger generation to um, tap into, you know, what you're, you're up to? Well, first and foremost, uh, those were the days that I had, that I showed. And most people now know my brother, Dennis. I'm always the one, the quiet one in the background. And I love that. Um, at the moment, I do a lot of promoting. I'm actually a taxi driver by trade but I do a lot of promoting um, and I have been doing so for maybe the last 35 years. Promoting dances, concerts, um, weekenders, holidays abroad. Um, I'm currently doing um, what they call the Sunrise Coast Weekender and that's happening on July the 22nd to the 25th of July. And I've got maybe 40 DJs um 10 comedians and about five live acts soul and reggae and that's going to be a blast so where is that and what's and that's saying? that's the sunrise coast weekender and that's in lower stuff suffolk and that, as i said that's on the july the 22nd to the 25th and how can people get tickets for that well you can get tickets on um www.partyace.com or www.getyourtickets.co.uk but you have to be really quick because they're almost sold out well um thank you so much for taking time out mm -hmm. we're here in new cross um and we're outside the flower of kent the flower of kent Many thanks.